diabetes is touted as having no cure, yet intensive lifestyle intervention programs successfully reverse diabetes, enabling people to restore normal blood glucose levels without medication. I asked Dr. Youngberg to explain this paradox. These august institutions say diabetes is incurable, basically, yet your book is titled Goodbye Diabetes. And you're not alone in that, calling that call. There mm -hmm. are people like Dean Ornish, Caldwell Esselstein, um, and many lifestyle medicine specialists. So tell us, what is it about lifestyle that is so powerful? You know, it's, it's interesting that this, um, this, the paradigm, the old paradigm, or even the current paradigm is saying there's no cure. Mm. The reason is that unless we have a strategy or a list of strategies that are sufficiently effective to get us to that tipping point where the, the, the metabolism is now working properly and there's no more resistance to insulin. Unless we accomplish that, there is no cure. And so, so if we're treating a problem that's not addressing the cause of insulin resistance, there's never going to be a cure. You might be able to control blood sugars, but you're not going to cure the problem. So lifestyle medicine is unique and that we're following all these strategies that literally reverse the underlying cause of resistance in the muscles and in the liver of insulin. And it makes the body more sensitive to smaller amounts of insulin. So now you have better blood sugars with less insulin, which not only means better, uh, less risk of prediabetes and diabetes, but also less risk of cancer, heart disease, hypertension, dementia, etc. So all those spin-offs, all of those good side effects. So tell us, without having to, I, I, I know our viewers should get the book, really. But we're <laughs> going to do a quick run through. When do we eat? When's the best time? Uh, my, my, my tips for patients is always eat breakfast. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who are overweight or have health problems, they have high blood sugars, they say, well, I know my blood sugar will go up if I eat. And so if I'm not really hungry, then I'm not going to eat. But actually, the metabolism is designed that need, we need to eat breakfast. Without breakfast, our metabolism doesn't come up, which means we don't burn very many calories. We then develop craving cycles, and we end up eating whatever is available for finger food, which is usually unhealthy for us. Mm. So make sure that we're always eating breakfast. So that's the key to preventing chaotic eating. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, you, in the book, you say that legumes are really important. Why? Not only do eating a beans, peas, or lentils uh, today for lunch lower our risk uh, for high blood sugars after lunch, but it will also lower our blood sugar response for dinner tonight, for breakfast tomorrow morning, and for lunch tomorrow. So mm -hmm. it's something that we do right now, eating legumes, beans, peas, lentils, for a meal right now will improve our blood sugars for the next three meals as well and give us good carbs and good protein. Lots of good magnesium and potassium and high fiber and yeah, like you said, key is good protein as well. Mm. Now, carbs get the bad rap often when it comes to diabetes. Tell us about carbohydrates with diabetes. The key with carbohydrates is to make sure that they're coming from whole foods. And so if carbohydrates have been refined and the good parts of those foods, the actual nutrients of those foods have been removed, then we're getting into what we call hypercaloric malnutrition, where we're getting a lot of calories, but the body's not getting the nourishment it needs to control insulin levels, to improve insulin sensitivity. So we need to eat healthy carbohydrate-rich foods, that, like legumes in particular, Okay? and other forms of whole grains, whole vegetables, whole fruits. Now, does it matter how much variety is in one meal? You're talking about a number of different macronutrients here. Especially if somebody is, is uh, struggling with digestive problems. We want to limit the total number of foods but uh, per meal, mm. but there needs to be a variety. In other words, let's not eat the same thing every day. Let's bring in a variety of foods so that we get a variety of nutrients and phytochemicals. The key is the, the, the actual uh, chemicals that reverse diabetes are the colorful pigments found in fruits and vegetables. 
they are literally the chemicals that cause epigenetic changes in our body that bring health and reverse disease. So I'm seeing a plate with some good carbohydrate, or got some whole food, some legumes, and then a rainbow of color, either fruits or vegetables. Absolutely, and I always tell my patients, the rainbow of colors doesn't mean Skittles, uh, Fruit Loops, or M&Ms. <laughs> okay, it means colorful, uh, colorful foods that come from nature and, and plant foods. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Now, after a meal, you talk about taking some exercise. That's that right. right. In fact, this is one of the most powerful strategies. That there was a study that just came out recently showing that after meal exercise, powerful in lowering blood sugars. The biggest problem with prediabetes or diabetes is that after a meal, the blood sugar will spike. That's the most sensitive time. You can have a completely optimal fasting blood sugar or pre-meal blood sugar, completely optimal two hours later, but if in the meantime you get a big spike, that high blood sugar will uh, not only damage the tissues, increasing the hemoglobin A1C, that's why we test that, um, but it will also stimulate an excessive release of insulin. And therein lies the problem. Okay. It's that extra insulin that drives the risk for cancer, heart disease, dementia, etc. We'll come right back to that. That's right, there's very little discussion about this and I'm very passionate about helping people understand that probably one of the most significant uh, benefits of understanding your blood sugars and your insulin levels is, is not only reversing or preventing diabetes and heart disease, but especially cancer, because all of us are very motivated to avoid cancer if at all possible. Mm -hmm. And this is especially important to me because my mother died of cancer, and that's what made me become interested in lifestyle medicine in the first place. Mm -hmm. I want to know what I can do to limit my personal risk for cancer, but as well as for my patients. And so just this past uh, January 2013, uh, the journal Diabetes Care came out with a huge study showing that individuals who've had diabetes more than 15 years much more likely to develop cancer. 60% more likely in men who have had diabetes for over 15 years and 80% more likely in women. Okay, But just being on insulin increased the risk of, of uh, cancer within a two-year time frame by 30%. And so taking the insulin to treat your diabetes increases your risk of cancer. If you're taking excess insulin and using that as an approach to control blood sugars where you really should be using exercise and nutrition as the primary approach. So insulin by itself is not the problem. It's, it's overusing insulin as a, a treatment approach instead of first line therapy which according to the American Diabetes Association has always been lifestyle intervention. So if we inappropriately treat diabetes by using medications primarily and not lifestyle, that will increase risk of cancer. That's what the studies are very clear about. Right, and so someone who has type 2 diabetes already has excessive amounts of insulin circulating in their bodies. It's just not enough to do the job, and so their doctor gives them some extra insulin. And that's where you're saying that the risk lies. Instead of doing the lifestyle modification, bringing their, their insulin levels down. So what we're learning now from these new studies, actually the studies have been showing this for 40 years, but the most recent studies were done with 29,000 diabetics. It was huge studies, and it's, so it's bringing to the forefront this concern, well, how should we be treating these individuals? Maybe our actual a treatment approach is actually increasing the risk of early death. And in fact, that's what the studies show. The more aggressive we become in treating diabetes with medication, the more likely that patient is to die earlier, which is counterintuitive and certainly counterproductive. We need to be doing what actually helps them, not make them die sooner. But there are also some choices with medication. And in your book, you mention using metformin as an alternative to insulin as a first-line therapy. Yeah, and of course, uh, metformin is one of the best medicines available for diabetes uh, because it actually has been shown to lower the risk of cancer by 30%. Mm -hmm. It's the medicines that actually increase the stimulation of insulin release 
that are associated with increased cancer risk. So metformin can be very helpful, but I must add that all the big studies, even on metformin, have shown that the, the, the most basic lifestyle intervention program, walking three times a week, losing 10 pounds in, 10, in two years through a, a modified diet, that was much more effective in preventing diabetes than metformin use. So, so while metformin can be very effective, it's not nearly as effective even as the most basic exercise nutrition program. Hmm. And what you've outlined there is 10 pounds in two years and... And being, uh, you know, walking for half walking an hour, half an, three, three to four times a week. That's not difficult for most people. Now, if somebody wants to reverse diabetes, it's going to have to be more aggressive than that. You know, you, you, want, to, you want to do some daily exercise. You want to incorporate the after-meal uh, physical activity in moderation to decrease that spike after the meal. You want to be aggressive about eating lots of healthy foods and being careful with the foods that aren't super healthy. Uh, and that's what helps people reverse diabetes. Another uh, lifestyle... Um that we aspect that we haven't talked about yet is sleep. Mm. Talk about sleep when, with respect to diabetes. Um, uh, sleep is a, is a huge uh, issue that has been not applied effectively in medicine. Um, if we just have one night of poor sleep, the next morning we are much more resistant to insulin, which means that the muscles now have to, um, or the, the pancreas has to produce more insulin in order for that muscle to accept the sugar and therefore control the blood sugar levels. So many of us who have normal blood sugar levels are only able to accomplish that because we're producing lots of insulin to compensate and that is made worse if we're not sleeping appropriately. So if we're not getting to bed roughly around 10 p.m. at night, we're at much higher risk of becoming insulin resistant pre-diabetic, diabetic, developing heart disease, and increasing your cancer risk. 